So I'm really curious to ask you, in your own definition, in your own words, how would you define justice? Well, I, I would get kind of webstery about it. I, I would define justice, one, in the divine sense. Justice is uh, that which serves the best interests of the growth of a human soul. Mm -hmm. Two, human justice is that which uh, serves the individual's or the community's perception of what is best okay. for, for the individual. Do you think those two things are often lined up with one another, or do you think they often deviate from each other? I think they deviate from one another. Do, is there one version of it you think is more true or is better? I believe that divine justice is more complete. Okay. So how do you apply, let's say, divine justice in your day-to-day -day life or examples or areas where that's kind of come into play with yourself? Well, a human being can only... A human being can only uh, apply divine justice to the extent that he or she knows... A, what is, uh, what is divine and what is justice. Mm -hmm. So as an example from the novel Les Miserables, where Jean Valjean steals a loaf of bread to feed his family, according to the dictates of the, Fr the French government at that point in time, any theft would be uh, subject to the swiftest and most judicious application of the law. Mm -hmm. But in divine justice, while it is wrong to uh, take someone else's property without their permission or without compensation, the greater justice would seem to be that the uh, person is, the person taking the bread is merely doing this one time mm -hmm. to, f to deal with an emergency situation. So the retribution would depend upon his uh, actions going forward. Does he get? A, does he accustom himself to taking food that that for which he does not prepare to pay, or does he turn around and seek to build someone the ability of himself and others to mm -hmm. produce food or to share food in the community level? That reminds me a lot. There's this interesting, it's a um, philosophical question. And I can't remember the name of the philosopher that posed it. But the idea is, he poses this question of, let's say you and your spouse are living in a fixed income, and your wife becomes very sick with an illness. And the only way to treat the illness is with a medication sold buy, let's say, a drugstore or pharmacy or something, and it cost like a million dollars, like something far beyond what you could ever afford to pay. And you find out that what they need in order to make a profit is something that is a price range that you could actually pay, that you without question basically are able to affirm that they are essentially stealing as much money or robbing people of as much money, squeezing them dry, however you want to kind of put it, as they possibly can in this scenario. And so the question posed is always, what are your choices of you can try to find a way to pay for it somehow or negotiate with them, but if they're uncompromising, the question comes down to, do you steal the medication? And the idea posed by the philosopher is he argues that the idea of following the justice system is perhaps an immature one of saying like, oh, well, you shouldn't steal because stealing is wrong or that that's breaking the law and therefore it's wrong because he argues that the right of human life is worth more than the right of private property. And that's kind of his view in 
arguing um, perhaps our views of how we should see certain terms of where does justice lie? Because we can definitely look at historically times where the justice system of what we identify as that has morally been wrong for perhaps like the civil rights movement where the justice system changes and its morals change. And so it's interesting that you defined justice in those two different terms, because I think that probably a lot of people get caught up in who aren't very religious or aren't very spiritual. They hear the idea of divine justice and perhaps historically, you know, thanks to various things that have happened in wars and using religion as a weapon, that makes a lot of people nervous. But I think in the human sense of justice, we can easily identify where our understanding of what is morally right, such as in the civil rights, or let's say identifying that it's uh, like it's not okay to try to steal this medication to save someone's life because the right of property outweighs it just based on the justice system. And you get kind of this complicated thing. So it's interesting you bring up divine justice there because that is a very different source. But the question though, like you said, is then what kind of is that source? So how do we identify what is the truest form of divine justice of what we can kind of be going off of? So how do you kind of decide what you would term as good divine justice or um, how you can put your trust in one form of divine justice or make that decision? You know, the, uh, the aspect of divine justice that needs to be borne in mind is that divine justice concerns itself with every level of the life of the soul. Uh, this, earthly, this earthly life is the second form in which a soul takes, uh, takes on life in, as the soul is presently constituted, the first being the embryo and, and the fetus in the womb. The, the growing baby in the mother's womb is, of course, not able to speak for itself depends entirely on the good graces of, of the mother, hopefully the father and the extended family, and hopefully the community, which I'm not going to address the whole issue of uh, reproductive rights at, at this point, because that's, that's another whole other subject. But mm -hmm. the, the embryo, once the fetus is born into, becomes an infant, until the day that person dies will be the physical life. And then this, the whole purpose of the physical life, as I understand it, and as Baha'i teachings describe, is to prepare one to build attributes, to build divine attributes and qualities, which will in turn serve us in the, in the next world, in the next level of, of spiritual development. And that in turn, every there are a number of levels which the soul can progress throughout all the uh, realms of spiritual development. So the life after this will be followed by yet another level and another level and another level as the soul merits through, uh, through spiritual development. So what qualities would you identify then, if we're to be extremely specific, what spiritual qualities are you obtaining in this life that you wish to carry on into the next one? Uh, in my, if, if I want, certainly the capacity to love unconditionally is the basis for everything else. But then there is ability to discern not only what my own needs are, but also to discern very quickly the needs of the other person of other people as I meet them. Generosity is good to a point, as long as, for example, the generosity is good up to a point, as long as it does not debilitate the person who is receiving the generosity, or as long as it doesn't bankrupt the person who is giving. In, in divine justice, there's a balance mm -hmm. between the needs of one soul and the needs of, of all the others. So what... What examples kind of throughout your own life have you kind of found where, because I agree with everything that you said, and 
I would think that most anyone with a pure heart can see that these are important qualities, regardless of why you think you're obtaining them or what you're attaining them for, that these are important, valuable ways to be. So how have you been able to kind of take these principles or these things that you're kind of developing and how have they manifested and in what ways have you had to be tested on those or have to apply them into your own life? Yeah, there are two things that two things among several that I had the privilege and the honor of sharing at a certain point. One is one is time and the other is money. I've never been a very wealthy person, but now I'm at the point in life where where I can meet my own needs without too much dependence on anybody else. If I have extra money, um, I support a few charities on a monthly basis. Others have been supported, and like the Facebook birth, the famous Facebook birthday ch- birthday charities, where somebody that I am fairly close to might say, "Well, in for my birthday this year, I'm giving." trying to raise $2,000 for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Well, I have supported St. Jude's in a small way from time to time, but I don't commit that every every person that comes on and says, it's my birthday, fork it over, mm-hmm. is going to get the money. It's basically how one conducts one's financial life is uh, illustrated by the principle of hukukala, that if you have, which is uh, Arabic for the right of God, and that is that, God is the source of everything. And how much do you return to God um, in the form of returning it to the needs of the human race and the planet Mm -hmm. through the trustees or through the universal house of justice, which is the Baha'i supreme administrative body. And so, for example, uh, when I have had a windfall, an inheritance or an, an exceptionally large tax refund on a given year, and it is above $1,000, then I would follow the formula, find out what is 19% of uh, 19 mythicals of gold at the day's price of gold. Mm-hmm. I, would, I would calculate that. I wouldn't just give a, a quick 19% of whatever amount of money I had. That's a quick and easy method of doing things, and it's it's not necessarily wrong, but it's not accurate, always accurate either. So, so I, I'm a little bit more discerning about that. So you follow a very like strict pattern of whenever you have an excess blessing uh, monetarily or financially in your life, you always try to abide by this idea of giving back a fixed amount of it charitably in return. Uh, in, ter- in terms of hukukala, I would follow that pattern. Now that's that doesn't happen constantly. If I give um, if I give a charity that's uh, uh, not one of those that I give to every month, I, I give to UNICEF every month. I give to the United Service Organizations every month. I give to uh, the Red Cross and there's one other um, a group called uh, Streetlight USA, which is a home for teenage girls who are uh, otherwise at risk. And it's, and there's only one of those, and it's down in Peoria. So, so you, I give some of the, I give money to those, and it's a relatively modest amount. I'm not, I'm not out to do the look at me thing mm-hmm. and promote myself. Uh, in fact, if one does not approach life from a humble posture of learning, from the sense of Humility being being a definitely a uh, an aspect of love that often gets overlooked. If you are humble about yourself and uh, not not loud and and bringing that everything I do is the best, which is a falsehood. But if one is humble and only speaks to uh, one's strengths every so often, and it's not a it's not a f- uh, defining feature of your personality, then. Mm-hmm. That's okay. So, how do you discern what charities you give to, and what is kind of your driving force of like how you decide these are worthy causes or ideas that you are worth investing into? Well, the uh, driving force of my life, for whatever reason, is the safety and well-being of children and teenagers. Another force, which is 
not quite as strong, but is still of concern to me, is the recovery of um, service members who've fought in armed conflict, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, for example. Mm -hmm. So, and the other, the Red Cross just happens to be a more wide-based service organization. Mm -hmm. I, I volunteer for them with my time, and I also contribute a small amount financially. Because you seem like someone who, in the time that I've known you, you reflect a great deal on kind of your purpose and your time and how to best kind of use your resources as a human being, as your soul, and the things that you possess around you and the things that are in your control, and how you can kind of best contribute those things and make use of that in this life. And it seems like you are constantly kind of thinking about that and that you don't think lightly when you come to those decisions. Because I don't know if I've ever told you the full story with this, but before I had actually ever met you, I had had a such and I told you briefly about this story where I had a scenario at work where I had to make a moral decision where I felt what was right to do was to make a certain report, but by doing that report, I would be potentially getting a lot of coworkers in trouble and causing a lot of problems with just my employer in general, even though I truly felt in my heart that this was the right thing to do. And I prayed on it, and I knew the way that I was trying to approach it was when my time comes and I'm on my deathbed, I have to stop and think, for what did I serve in my life? Did I serve my employer? Did I serve for money? Did I serve to protect other people who may or may not have deserved it potentially or been in a litigious situation potentially? Or am I serving a greater cause and being tested for what I feel is the true sense of justice and rightness in the universe? And I made that decision and I prayed about it and I prayed, I need some clarity. I need something. And the day that that whole event happened, I actually got an email from you that you were coming through town. I had never met you before. And you just sent me an email saying that you were coming through Havasu. And immediately I asked you to come stay a night with us because I, I took this. I thought this is a sign. And, it, and I'm not just talking about the same day, but it was probably like an hour or two later that I got your email that I was dealing with this scenario. And so I took that as I need to look into this more closely. And so upon meeting you, I told you um, that whole story and in more detail of the specifics of kind of what was happening. But in, in an overview, what I just described is it's basically just a moral decision, a moral decision of what I feel is right in my heart. And so I asked you on the basis of, was this the right moral choice to make? And is it right then to make a decision that others may view as potentially reckless or jeopardizing um, in terms of my employer, my financial stability, my lifestyle, a lot of those types of things. And you shared with me some pretty profound experiences through your own life where surprisingly you had gone through very similar moments where you had to make very similar decisions. And it was upon that moment that I really realized like this is why you came to see me and why I heard from you at the time that you did is at that moment I felt this is how I knew I made the right decision. And to give you an, a quick update on all of that, it all worked out. <laughs> it all worked out very perfectly. But I, if you're okay with that, I, I'd like to hear kind of your stories and examples of moments where you've kind of had to make a moral decision, if you'd like to share those and how you kind of approach those scenarios. Because I, I know that those brought me a great deal of guidance at the time that I needed them. Okay, these may or may not be the same ones that we talked about at the time. I don't, uh, I don't doubt you have a lot. <laughs> there are three. I will start with. I will start with the occasion when, when I was a counselor at the Jedito School, north of Kings Canyon. It was my second year. 
or my third year actually, because uh, you know, the third year I was there, I had to think in terms of the super, who was superintendent at the time. A teacher who was should have been on medication, uh, did not take his medication of a certain day. He was a teacher at, at a level where kids like to test the waters. So there were a bunch of rowdies that thought that they could goof around and, and drive teachers up a wall on that particular day. This teacher yelled and cajoled and, and moved seats and whatnot, and finally he lost his patience, picked up a stapler, threw the stapler at in the direction of the child. The, child, the stapler hit the child off the side of the head, and that's where everything stopped. Uh, teachers next door heard the commotion, and the teacher was sent home for the day for medical reasons. The child was taken to the hospital and he had a concussion and there were, the child was also the son of one of the staff members. Oh, wow. So there was a lot of commotion. I basically, as the counselor, I took a position of the, that the child health and safety were paramount. I filed a letter to the building principal saying that this particular teacher needed to be relieved of his duties. The teacher in question was a friend of the superintendent. The superintendent came down on me like a ton of bricks, but I said, I'm, with all due respect, sir, my position is the same. And eventually, with the, with encouragement from the governing board who took basically took my side in the matter. The superintendent grew to change his opinion of me. The child survived. The teacher left at mid-year and eventually was able to he was able to get a job at a school that was less uh, somewhat less strict about who they hired. Somehow he managed to not get himself into any trouble further on. The second situation, which was a, li a lot less dramatic. I was building principal at a school near Chin Lee in the Navajo Nation. Question, uh, a request was made by the chairman of the school board to be reimbursed gas money for going to a uh, meeting in Window Rock, the Navajo Nation capital. The My decision was to accept or to uh, refuse that request was based on the fact that this same individual was also the Navajo, the delegate of the area for the Navajo Tribal Council, Navajo Nation Council, and he was receiving reimbursement through that source. The fact that I didn't allow him to double dip was one of the grounds for my dismissal at the end of the year. Oh, wow. So you lost your job because of that? Yeah. Not only that, there was another, there was a situation I think I mentioned to you in, in passing also that there was a, uh, a teacher assistant who died in a one-vehicle accident and her family, very superstitious, or some family members thought that I had performed witchcraft on her. Okay. No, you never mentioned that story to me. Yeah. And so I was, and this was a a Navajo like a yeah like school right. Okay, why did they think you performed witchcraft on them? I don't know because that they the circumstances that the woman dying in a one vehicle accident it is um, the Navajos some Navajos not all believe that a person can throw a hex on somebody else from a distance. So the fact that I was in Jedito with my son and my wife that night, it was Halloween night, that I returned to the other community after she had died. And I was told by my assistant principal as to what happened. That's, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. So you... That, that was, yeah, that was the other contributing factor to my being let go. So what ended up happening in the future, long term, from that whole situation of losing your job? Well, I, I got another job as a building principal. That like in, a better job? In another part of the state, yes. Okay. 
So it worked out in the end? It worked out for a year. Has it ever not worked out for you when you've tried to when you've had to make a decision like this? Long term, no. No, it's not, when one door closes, another one always opens. Now, a door that has remained open consistently has been substitute teaching. The third incident I want to mention occurred in 2000, I believe it was 2007. Yeah, 2006, 2007. I was substituting in a kindergarten class in the Phoenix area. And at lunchtime, one of the little girls came up to me on the playground and said that her friend was very upset that a mean lady had yelled at her and, and she was very upset. I went over to the girl and talked with her. And I did, and to calm her down, help comfort her and calm her down, I did something that, according to the mores of America, or the standards of, of American society, uh, is not always uh, seen in the best light. And I leaned down and kissed her on top of her head. And she started to then immediately, the same person who had yelled at her and caused her to be upset in the first place came charging over and said, and started yelling at me. I was trying to take advantage of the child and blah, 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 blah. Well, the administration made a quick decision that it would be better if I leave the school for that day. So I did. That's that's so unfortunate. And, you know, I worked in an elementary school for quite a few, for quite a while as essentially a PE teacher. And I was one of two men who was on the staff of a school with over 400 kids. And I definitely get what you mean by there's a lot of eyes on you as a as a man in education, especially with younger kids. And it's unfortunate because that kind of act and that kind of behavior in other cultures and other countries is not even looked down upon. And it, it, if it's coming from a place of purity, in, then, you know, we, we have this quick reaction. And in the U.S., we've created such a stigma, such a nervousness. We're a very litigious um, culture in what we've created, where we're so uncomfortable inside of our own skin, where every little thing we're seeing is very nefarious. So do you do you have more on that, that yes, third I, story? Yes, I do. Okay. So my reaction when I was let go, it was noon. I went over to the district office to the substitute coordinator and sat down with her and basically reported myself out. Said this is what happened. She said, "Well, my immediate reaction, if I were a parent and you kissed my child on the forehead, I would have been pretty upset." But she said, "Here's the deal: uh, you're going to have to take a few weeks off from this district, and we're going to investigate." So she did. Eventually, they they found came to the conclusion that I had done nothing wrong, and I was allowed back in. At the end of that school year, two or three months later both the playground aide who had caused the problem in the first place and the school counselor who was defending her were both let go. Wow, so both of the people who... So you ended up keeping your job, but both of the people who kind of reacted maliciously both disappeared. Right. So in the long term, that just worked out fine. Yeah. That has pretty much... And I was taught long ago by some good-hearted friends in the, when I was in the service in the Washington, D.C. area, I had friends who were not military, who were kind of counterculture. One lady was in, at that time, what was called the Gay Liberation Front, and she was a platonic friend. Something that she said to me, no matter what happens, if you come from a place of truth, if you come from a place of love, you will never suffer. Yeah, you know. In long, in at length. It's it's interesting that you say that because well, something my dad always says to me is constantly whenever I have some worry, he's like, "Trust in God." He just says that to me over and over mm-hmm. again. He's like a broken record. So reflecting and listening to those three separate stories, there's something you said in the first story where you were talking about my priority being that of the welfare and wellness of the child, and. Not necessarily that in particular, but it sounds like as you go through these various scenarios and you have these moral issues that you have to have, 
you have to navigate in life. It sounds like you have a core set of principles or ideas, kind of like what you were saying just now, if you're coming from a sincere place of love. It sounds like, though, that you have a, a, a series of ideas or principles that you abide by above all else. Do you think you could verbalize, like, what, what, like, are the most important laws or ideas or, like, structured things that you can kind of put into words that you keep in the back of your mind as you go through each one of these situations as what your priority is and how you're going to navigate these situations? Okay, there, again, there's probably a set of three things that from which everything else grows out. The first is that I am re- I am responsible for myself, that any time I've ever cast blame outside myself for anything, it has not been sat- either satisfying or productive. And a lot of the uh, blame casting that I might have gotten in to in, in the long run was in the uh, short term was a lack of self-confidence. So being responsible for yourself Again, trusting in God, the universe, the the greater world is uh, is a matter of having the self confidence that things are going to happen in the right way. The second thing, and this comes from my upbringing, mother was and is adamant. It's the primary duty of adults and older children to look out for the best interests of those children, especially who are not in an equal position of strength. And I may have mentioned to you that my youngest brother was severely autistic, no, had multi- he, multiple health issues. No, you never mentioned that okay. to me. He, was, he had, he had a, a traumatic birth. It wasn't, his, wasn't my mother's fault. It was just circumstances. And he, this was in, when he was growing up, it was in the late 60s throughout the 70s when a lot of uh, handling of medication for people with neurological diseases was in its infancy. So there was a lot of experimental stuff going on. He would be given a regimen of of amphetamine-based medication for a while. Then he would be given a regimen of barbiturate-based medication for a while. Oh, wow. And back and forth and back and forth. Jeez. And that's the worst thing you can do for someone with with an unstable mental development like that and neurological disorder. Right. So he was, at his core, he was, a, he was a wonderful human being. And mother was very protective of him, as you might imagine. We, we in turn, both, uh, all, not just me, but my four siblings, my four other siblings, or, oh, I'm sorry, my three other siblings, were all protective of him. And we have grown to be, to become nurturing, protective human beings in different ways. In my case, nurturing and and taking care of the less fortunate or taking care specifically of children and youth became my life's work. My sister celebrated her birthday yesterday. She chose not to work but to be a stay-at-home mother, volunteered taking care of babies at her church. And as basically as the grandchildren have come, she's become super nana. She just takes care of everybody the best she can. So do you think that growing up with a brother who had all of those issues played a big role in you choosing the career path that you did? I think so, even though I was was oriented towards that even as a child, to be uh, looking out for my younger brother. siblings, even though they were neurotypical. Mm-hmm. And I had uh, gradually, through the head traumas that were that come with being a boy, running around with, with other boys and such, that those things kind of contributed to, in my view, to my autism. But besides that, even uh, in my neurotypical state, mm-hmm. I'm always looking out for the children, for their well-being. Mm-hmm. For the teenagers, and are they being allowed to be listened, to be heard? Um, that brings me to to point number three: that every soul has a life plan, in whether in this life, gearing towards the next. That every soul has a right to pursue those of their dreams and and uh, interests that are not injurious to the self and others. Mm-hmm. 
So well, that that excuse me that ranges that impacts my views on everything from the right of the fetus to be born balanced with the right of the mother to make a choice. So do you think looking at looking at these kids, looking at your own career and looking at the paths that you've taken in life, do you think a lot of it is from putting yourself in the shoes of seeing yourself in these kids and that's kind of led to where you are now? There's some of that. There's some of that. I, I, mother's other major point in raising us was always look at the situation the other person is in before you react. And she saw and sees very few people as enemies, but rather people who are in different, more likely people who are in different circumstances, which need to be considered. Now, it doesn't mean if I'm if uh, somebody's coming at me with a loaded with a loaded firearm, that I'm just going to lay down and let them shoot. Mm-hmm. I have a responsibility to more people than just the angry person at the time. And they basically, I've not uh, been given to patronizing people, to making decisions on their behalf without their input. Uh, my my late wife Penny, she would have been 67 years old today when she was in her last stages of of this life, there was a situation where she was at a hospital in Phoenix and the choice was presented to us by a self-appointed expert in the field of the, in the, uh, in treating the neurological disease that that she had. And this woman said, well, I've seen so-and-so and so-and-so and so on, all these cases of this disease, and I know what there is to know about it. And I think that your wife should be given a tracheotomy and put on a machine the rest of her life, and she won't be able to move, but she'll be alive. The other option is that we discharge you and discharge her, and she goes somewhere else. Well, Penny made the decision that she wanted to go somewhere else. She was not willing to be given a tracheotomy, hooked up to a breathing machine, and stationary, even though she was bedridden otherwise. So... When she stood her ground and I backed her up and our son supported the decision, she was sent to hospice care. And there was in-home hospice care and then uh, extraneous care in in the hospice itself facility. Uh, her life ended in the hospice facility because it was at, at a time when, when there was rampant pneumonia and illness was striking uh, a lot of medical professionals in January of 2011. So her attending physician who came to the house, his nurse, who also came to the house, were both, uh, both came down with serious flu and were not able to come. So she had, uh, the, the only care that she had was a series of nurses and nurse practitioners who were very uh, were very much under the gun at that point that mm-hmm. because of the situation with the with the hospice. We also had, uh, um, I, I stood my ground on this matter, that the some of the staff of the hospice came to the house and said, we think what you need to do is sign your sign wife's uh, monthly disability payments over to the state of Arizona and put her in a home. I ran that by Penny, and she said, no, I want to be here, or I want to be someplace where you can visit me easily. The individual who started that whole thing went back to the hospice and started a whispering campaign that that I really didn't care about my wife, and all I cared about was the money. Yeah, and that's, that's that danger of gossiping with things like that. Yeah. They even... Ran that, ran that by my in-laws. Um, I saw what I regarded as the evil, and Penny saw it for what it was, and we withstood that. Eventually, my, my in-laws knew me better than that, and they, they didn't buy it. You know, I, I've, I've seen scenarios like that play out in the medical field a million times before, and it's, uh, I think the harshest part is that because it is so common for people to take advantage of their family members in ways like that. 
it's so common for teachers or adults or maybe grown men to take advantage of kids now that all of these things, they make it so that in the world when you are an actual honest person, when you are coming from a place of love, you aren't perceived that way sometimes. Right. And that makes it very difficult. But I love that it has never discouraged you from still abiding by what you believe is right and sticking to those morals and principles. I didn't know that today was um, Penny's birthday, so I'm, I'm glad I got to spend a part of it with you. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me on this. And there's there's so many things that that you've said that I, I, I could ask so many questions on because I've I've always taken everything you've told me, all the advice, all the lessons you've told me, and I've really taken them to heart. And I know they've helped me a great deal in, in many times in my own life because I know that you would never do anything unless you knew you were coming from what you believed in your heart to be true and what is honest and what is good above all else. And I think it's very difficult because we live in a world where not many people are thinking outside of themselves. And there's something that you said, the first thing you said in regards to your own advice is that idea of taking responsibility for yourself. And it's so funny to hear you say that because I just did a talk very recently with a dear friend of mine, Sammy Joe, And that was one of the big things that she spoke about was that moment in her life when she took responsibility for herself and for her own actions and looking at those things where she was maybe blaming other people or blaming the universe. And in many ways, how I see it, oftentimes we we blame God or we blame the universe and we're fixated on being the underdog or we're fixated on being the victim in life. But I agree with you completely that the sooner you take responsibility for yourself and the condition of your own soul, the sooner you can actually start to make a difference, the sooner you can actually be happy and stop kind of feeling bad for yourself in a lot of ways. But I appreciate you taking this time with me. The last thing I'd like, I'd like to ask and I'd like to hear you on, I'd like you in honor of, you know, the memory of, of Penny and what you knew she stood for. I like to always ask people what advice or what things would could you share in verbal form if you could tell everyone in the world of something a change or something that has brought you a great deal of peace or meaning in your own life what words or wisdoms of example do you think you would share and what things possibly do you think you saw penny exemplify and value in her own life that you would like to live on past her and her memory that she would want to possibly share. Okay, the, the thing that jumps out at me right away, again, is that everyone should be able to pursue their own dream. And I would tell, if I were to tell my 12-year-old self or my 18-year-old self or our son when he was younger or any grandchildren I might have, I would t- say... Do not judge the quality of your dream or the merits of your dream by how easy that dream is to fulfill. Because sometimes little little dreams that you want to achieve, uh, other people have done that same thing often enough so that it's relatively streamlined. Other dreams you might have, a lot of people have tried and a lot of people have failed. Or they have achieved those dreams only after a great deal of difficulty and more than one setback. And we could apply that to everybody from Thomas Edison's famous remark about the light bulb took a thousand steps to develop. Oh, the, like, oh, I found 999 other ways to not make a light bulb? Basically, something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, I've heard that before. Yeah. So it's all how you approach the steps that are necessary to achieve your dream, including the pushback, including the setbacks. How do you approach dealing with those things? Do you allow them to dishearten you and turn you away? There are any number of of, uh, occasions when a girl or a woman sets things, sets herself a certain goal, and she gets told, "Eh, you're you're just a girl. You'll never get there. Let the men do, do the work. And you sit back and be a wife and mother. 
I was fortunate to have been raised in a home where my mother had skills as a cosmetologist and she could work wonders and did, just working in the house, in the kitchen. I would run her errands for her and go down, get on a bus and go to uh, cosmetology, a licensed cosmetology shop with a letter from my mom wanting this, that, and the other thing. And back in those days, in the 50s and early 60s, it wasn't a hard thing to do. And I accomplished uh, any number of errands for her. But my basic, my other point, my greater point with regard to mom is that she exuded strength being decisive and putting the needs of others in perspective. Mm Mm-hmm. Following that golden rule, yeah, yeah, she was, uh, she was a was and is a model of the golden rule. So, w- how would you see Penny's views on perhaps this question? Penny, w- Penny had a, an enormous heart. Uh, she had been raised differently, more towards what's in it for me. She was always struggling with that because she want she wanted so much to give to other people. She kind of coaxed me out of my, at the time, shyness or or reluctance to engage with other people. And that was her gift to me. And I, in turn, helped her move beyond those aspects of her upbringing that were based, rooted in Mm -hmm. self-interest. She she was the only natural-born child of her family. Uh, She had two, she has... uh, two adopted sibling younger sisters who were twins and they're still both alive um, I haven't heard from them for a long time but they basically became uh, decent human beings and, and lived honorable lives you know my, my dad was just telling me about how you can't take your environment and use it as an excuse to be a certain way that you do have to take responsibility for the condition of your own soul and you really have to make good of things, and it's on you to be a good person. But it really sounds like the memory of Penny and those things that she brought to you, you still honor to this day all these years later. If Because every time I, I speak to you and I always see what you're working on is you're always thinking of others. You always have your gaze fixed upon others, and I greatly admire that with you. Is I don't think I, I ever hear about any self-interest from you. It's always thinking about what things you're putting your mental effort toward of what you can do to kind of serve mankind around you. So I greatly admire and appreciate that. So thank you. You're welcome. And I thank you once again for taking the time to talk to me at this time and on this day especially. Sure. Well, one thing about September 30th and also our wedding day, June 6th, and even her death day, March 5th, those are, these are days in which I have to weigh what I'm going to do very carefully. Mm-hmm. And so what I have ended up, usually it's ended up in a Baha'i-based activity or a Baha'i-themed activity or inspired activity has presented itself. Well, then and I'm, today is no exception. I'm glad. I, I, I didn't even know today was what it is today, so... I'm glad that at this point I've come out to see you at the time I did. And it's funny that this happened because you came out and saw me at a time that you had no idea the implications of what it meant to me for you to reach out at the time that you did and for you to visit me at the time that you did. So Mm -hmm. I'm glad we've been able to come full circle with that. So thank you and I appreciate it. And thank you for taking this time with me. You're welcome.